All right. Yesterday, the reviewing the first day, we discussed the aesthetic math, the aesthetic considerations when it comes to producing music, specifically how one processes the signal in order to come with up with a commercial a commercial sound, a sound which is broadly popular. <clears throat> Yesterday we started on talking about approaches that could be it could be executed either in an analog fashion or a digital fashion. But most of what we were talking about were techniques where the preferable way that budget allows is to execute in an analog fashion. But we didn't quite finish it, so there's one thing on the record. Transformers. Now we're all familiar with transformers as what we do for, you know, in, 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 as far as power, power, powering whatever equipment we have, this and that and whatnot. And if you think that there would be no place in the signal path to put transformers, from an engineering standpoint, you would be right. I mean, they're terrible. They're, they are replete with just about every kind of nonlinearity you can imagine. But we're dealing with a subject where considerations are often determined by aesthetics and a market, and not by simple engineering. So, and we're also dealing with the situation that for much of the last hundred years, there was there were transformers throughout the entire signal path that ran from the microphone in the studio right into the speaker in the user's household. Now, since the 1960s, there's been a decline in the number of transformers in this long, long signal path. The result being from an engineering standpoint is it was improved fidelity, but from an aesthetic and commercial standpoint, people have made it very clear that the music is not sounding like they expected it to sound like. Now, even though the transformer has almost disappeared in the consumer side of this chain, that means it's now up to the production side of this chain to have a judicious use of transformers in order to give the people the sound that they are expecting to hear. <clears throat> now, the, there are companies that have been, like this one for instance, that has been making uh, transformers for audio work for quite a long time. Let's go on to the next one. And look at the prices that people are paying for a single transformer. Now, these are all dollars, multiply them by 70, and you see that they're very expensive, and that's why you do not find them in the signal path at the consumer side. But it's something we really need to think about from the production side. Uh, now, one of the things that is curious is they're, they're nonlinear in every fashion. First of all, in terms of dynamics, they will saturate like any other device will saturate. They uh, have nonlinearities due to the fact that they're, they are, of course, inductive, but because of the very, very thin insulation on the wires, they're also capacitive, and then they're resistive. So in that when you have a transformer in your hand, you're basically looking at a very, very complicated resonance device that you don't even know how it's going to perform until you actually put it into a circuit. Even things going on around it will influence the way that it works. So dealing with transformers from an engineering standpoint in the signal path is an audio nightmare but it's something we still have to do because the audience expects a certain amount of, of transformer distortion, or let's just say color, in the signal path. Let's look at some of the interesting things. Next one. This is a, this is a high-end uh, microphone preamplifier, and this is a high-end price. These are dollars, these are not rupees. So you know, multiply it by 70 or 71, and you're looking at something that is really very expensive. Next picture. You notice also in terms of the aesthetics, the design aesthetics, it, harps, it, harp, it, it, it takes us back to the 1940s. It is an aesthetic which is very, very dominant in the production field. Next one. Now look at this. It's hard to see, but this is a three-position switch. When the switch is in the upper position, you're using a nickel core transformer. When the switch is in the middle position, you're using an iron core transformer. And when the switch is in the bottom position, you're using a steel core transformer. Okay, that's simply because the transformer has become such an important part in determining what kind of sound you have. Engineers want to have the ability to choose between the nickel, iron, or steel sound. 
From a purely engineering standpoint, this machine is insane. But as I've been saying for the last couple few days, we're dealing with a field which is determined by, primarily by aesthetics and market and not by simple engineering considerations. Before we leave transformers, any questions? Okay, next question. Now, <coughs> let's look at this as a single process. Go back one more. Uh, I think I'm, okay, let's look at this. This is a, a very simple example of a, of a, of a, tra of a, of a processor. Go back to the earlier one. And it's nothing in the world but transformers and bypass switches. There is no active components in this whatsoever. All we're doing is passing the signal uh, through the transformer and out. That's it. Completely passive. Again, this is a machine that from an engineering standpoint makes no sense at all, but from a commercial and artistic standpoint, it makes perfect sense. Okay, next one. All right. Right now, we finished talking about all the different things that can be done in an analog fashion. A lot of things that many times the business says should be done in an analog fashion. But getting something which is more germane to this, uh, this workshop, from now on, we're going to be talking about techniques that, either, that really cannot or should not be done in an analog fashion. They're either impossible or they become so awkward. We just wouldn't consider it. So right now, we're going to discuss time-based processing. Next one. Let's look at just a simple delay. It's really nothing in the world, but if we put an impulse on here, run it through the delay, after a certain period of time, we get the output. Now, there are many things that we can do with this, but one of the most common ones is to use as like a chorus effect, but it's also useful in just purely musical and compositional uh, for compositional reasons. Now, there's a part, there's a fundamental weakness in this thing in that all we're getting is a delay signal. So, without anything to form a reference in our mind, it's not much use. So, let's look at the next one. Uh, let's stop and see how historically the delay was implemented. Here we have a piece of tape. It just goes like that in a loop. And it's based on the fact that the uh, uh, record head and playback head are offset. And so you'll get a delay, which is a function of this distance and the tape speed. This is how delays were, were implemented from the 1950s, actually. Next one. As I said, this is how it is. It's basically, you pass a tape hit. It's recorded on one here, a fraction of a second later. It's played back. Very straightforward, and, 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 and was the origin of a lot of these uh, musical effects, but it's essentially impossible to do nowadays because of the disappearance of tape machines. Next. This is something called the Necroplex, which takes the same idea, but it's designed specifically for being a tape delay. You've got your tape here, you have your heads, now you can actually move the position of the heads, you can change the, both the uh, distance of the heads as well as the speed of the tape. So this was much more flexible, but this was the way delays were introduced. So probably, I think, in the late 60s, this was very common. Next. All right. Now, the problem with the tape delays, historically, has been you have moving parts. Tape breaks, the tapes wear out. So, in 1971, the Cooper time tube was introduced. And it's really nothing in the world but links of garden hose, for which one end has a microphone and the other end has a speaker. And the Cooper time tube was very uh, important for two reasons. One is that it could be it was reliable, you could use it in a studio day in and day out, there was nothing to wear out. But curiously enough, it had a very strong coloration. If you can imagine that the resonance Im implied by having a, a length of garden tube would make for a device that was extremely colored. Now, I bring that up now because even though we wouldn't consider using a Cooper time tube in production work today, if you're going to sell uh, any kind of delay type device or any type of uh, uh, you know, software for echoes and delays and everything. This is something that you should be emulating. Next one. Okay, 1969, the Bucket Brigade device was introduced, which is a sort of a cross between a digital and analog device. What it is, is it would take a signal and break it up into 
analog samples, not digital, analog samples, and pass them from one capacitor to another. See these capacitors right here? It was like switches, and we just keep passing the, this analog sample down the chain, hence the name of the bucket device. They were terrible. They sounded absolutely horrible, but they were economical, and you could get a, a, a delay uh, effect for your studio for it would be very small and would not cost a lot of money. But it had a very particular sound. This, too, is something that there are people out there who are selling and giving away uh, plugins in order to emulate the sound of these bucket brigade devices. Any questions? Okay, next. All right, now we get to something which is a little more practical. Just a simple delay is not terribly useful because we don't have a sense of, a sense of reference. But if we take the initial signal coming in, and if we sum it with the delay signal, then being able to listen to the two together makes much more sense from an artistic standpoint. Now, one thing that's interesting, let's look at this delay here. Because of some tricks of um, uh, cycloacoustic tricks, this delay really needs to be greater than about oh, around 40 to 50 milliseconds. If it's, if it becomes less than that, you no longer hear the second sound, you only hear the first one. So all kinds of funny things will happen, like these sort of things can affect your sense of pan, where the signal is coming from in the uh, in the stereo. Um, in the stereo field, but it may not actually come as a second sound to your mind because of something known as if memory call it, if me if memory serves me well, something like the Haas effect. I don't think I'm spelling it right, but you can all look it up on the internet. Let's go on another thing. Okay, <clears throat> a very classic implement implementation of an echo would be not just a text, not just a summation of the delayed signal. <clears throat> and the input signal. Incidentally, the term in use in the studio is wet and dry. Wet for your effective signal, and dry for your original unaffected signal. So more than just having a mixture of your delay signal, your wet signal, and your dry signal, if you again take some of the delay signal, bring it back, and sum it again with our input signal, now with the proper scaling factor, then we'll start to have an exponential decay like this. Now this is Nato. Now I bring this up because, especially in India, for some reason in the studios, the, there's been a tendency to use reverb and echo as, in the, as being synonymous. Well, they're not really synonymous. This is actually an echo. What constitutes an echo is that each one of these human beings is coherence. There's really very little um, convolution of the signal. Let's look at the next one. If you keep the same overall architecture, but would reduce the delay time, if the delay time is small enough, from a cycloacoustic standpoint, it resembles a real reverberation. But it still does not really convolute the signal that well. Another thing that's problematic is if you've ever listened to it, it really does not sound very good at all. Yes. But for the human ear, sometimes if the reverb and the echo sounds the same, like how to identify it? Is it coherent? <laughs> is, it, it, is it a very coherent echo or is it just sort of like an ash, like a, you know, a reverberance? If, if it loses all its coherence, then uh, from an aesthetic standpoint, it's a reverb. If it's a, if it's a coherent, if it's a coherent signal that comes again and again and again, that's echo. That's really the difference between an echo and a reverb. From a, from, a, from a technical standpoint, this comes pretty good to imitating what we want. The only problem is it doesn't sound good. So let's bring it to the next one. If we introduce a pre-delay, now we've got something which is useful in the studio, where we have our initial signal. That's just the dry signal coming through. There is a pre-delay determined by this delay here. And then we have our exponential decay from our previously described signal. Now, again, the problem here is even though we have uh, shortened it to the point where it resembled a reverb, it's still not a reverb. 
Still, this is there's a, this does not have a very heavy convolution. Uh, do you all understand what we mean by convolution? Uh, okay, let's have, okay, let's let's put it this way. Um, I mean, it, it, in, in other words, when things become mixed together to the point <clears throat> where it becomes a very difficult matter to try and uh, deconvolute. Okay, that would be the simplest way I could think of it. Okay, the next one. Now, if you want to get fancy here, if we have different, different delay lines with different, different parameters, then we get something where we really have a much more easily convoluted signal. Next. All right. Let's go with and see what has inspired a lot of this interest in, in reverb and delay. This was an echo chamber. And that's not really an echo chamber, it's a reverb chamber. You see a speaker here, you see two microphones, these are ribbon microphones. It is a room, and the room is totally dedicated towards producing reverb. This is what high-end studios used back in the 50s and 60s. Next. Now, this is another interesting thing. This one is called a plate reverb. You basically just have a big plate. It's very, it has metal, it's very, very loosely held into place. The plane has essentially a couple of speakers, uh, elements attached to it, and a couple of microphone transducers, and you can shift them around. And when the plane begins to vibrate, then you have a real, absolute reverb-like sound. It's very, very heavily, very highly convoluted signal. And this is the only one of the analog reverbs that you will still find in use today. Everything else in terms of reverbs is all digitally implemented. But this is one where, if you got the money, remember that's US uh, over $3,000, if you got the money, you can have a real analog reverb. For most everybody else, the plain reverb sound is a ubiquitous setting on your reverb software or your reverb uh, outside processor. Any other questions? Okay, next. The spring reverb, as I mentioned, I believe it was yesterday, was invented by Hammond. You basically have a spring. Under tension, you have a speaker element on one side. You have a microphone element, transducer on the other. And the spring just goes back and forth. And that was how you kind of the signal that way. The spring reverb is also a very, very common setting on your reverb units, even though uh, I've not seen what actually used in real life in many, many years. Next. Now, this is an effect that you can only do in the digital domain, where if you have your input signal, and instead of the exponential decay, you have an exponential rise. Now, you will not find this in the real world. There's no real world analog whatsoever. But that's one reason why this has become very commonly used Whenever you're dealing with ghost movies and things like that, both you know you hear it in Bollywood films, Hollywood films, Hollywood films. Whenever they want some spooky, you know, ghost-like thing, you can feel the action of the reverb coming before the sound actually occurs. Well, that's how this is just a uh, this is just a uh, <coughs> reverb which is working in, in reverse. In the old days of tape machines. You could take, take your tape, you could record your sound, reverse the tape on the machine, then record the reverb. When you turned it back, then you have a reverse reverb. But you can understand that even though it can be done, it has been done analog, it's not something that can be done in any uh, real time fashion in the real world because that means the machine is having to read the future for which there is no such machine. But this is an effect that you've all heard, and if you heard it, you, you recognize it instantly. Next. Now, everything we've talked about so, so far <clears throat> has been essentially a software emulation of the hardware reverbs of some 40 years ago. Because as we as we were very clear right now, that provides the aesthetic roadmap for what we want to do. But since we're dealing with a digital domain, it's a different thing. You see. Delay lines were very, very, very expensive back 40 years ago. And so you wanted to get the maximum bang for the buck for whatever delay line you had in your design. Today, a delay line is nothing in the world but writing to a buffer. 
and some fraction of a second later, reading back from the same buffer. It's cheap, it's not computationally intensive, so we, we are not limited by the number of delay lines we want to have. We can have any number of delay lines we want, with any kind of delay factor we want, we can sum them with any kind of scaling factor we want, and we can really come up with some very, very good convolution to give us any kind of sound that we want. Okay, now, everything that we've been doing so far is an algorithmic approach. But there's another approach. Convolution reverbs. Okay, next one. Now, the convolution reverb, you basically create an impulse response file. One way that that's done is like you go into a big auditorium and you take a starter pistol or something and you fire and you record it and you record the response of the room. That is an impulse file. You use this impulse file as a roadmap to convolute the input of your signal. So this is done totally digitally. It's very, very common and it produces some of the most natural reverbs that you, that you could possibly want. Next. All right, now let's leave that and let's go to time stretching and compression. This is something that really, I can't say that there was enough, never any analog equivalent, but for all practical purposes, this is something that can only be done in the digital domain. It can only be done in software. Let's look at time and pitch shifting. Now, this is the first thing to remember. There is no single approach to time or pitch manipulation which works in every situation. They will all fail you under certain circumstances. So if you need to be into that situation, what I mean by time and pitch shifting would be, you know, like the uh, um, uh, Antares auto-tune, harmonizers, any granular base type of uh, pitch changing, time changing, things like that. That's what we're dealing with here. Now, I'm not, I can't even, even pretend to give you all the different approaches out there. Both for, partly because there's so many of them, I don't know them all. Another reason is they tend to be proprietary. So unless you're actually working with the company that programs them, the details can be very sketchy. Resampling. This is the easiest and oldest of all. Next one. Essentially what you're doing is you're taking your file and resampling it like if you want to make it shorter. If this, you make it shorter, you resample it, reduce the number of samples, you have increased the uh, pitch, at the same time you have decreased the, uh, the uh, length. And you, yeah, if you resample the other direction, you can take it, you can resample it to increase the length and then lower the pitch. Now, next one. Let's look at the advantages of it. It's the simplest algorithm to implement. It'll work on the slowest machine you've got. It produces no unpleasant artifacts. Now the bad thing, the only bad thing about it, is you have no separate control of pitch and time. Absolutely none. It's essentially now just to take, taking a tape machine and speeding it up or slowing it down. Now, time domain harmonic shifting. This is also known as synchronized overlap and add. This is pretty simple in its overall philosophy. You determine your period, okay? You take that period, you make it, you just take a sample of that from your period, you resample it, again, same way as before. If you resample it to increase the size, you, you slow the pitch down. I didn't say slow the music down, you reduce the pitch. And then you overlap and add. That means you convert it back into, uh, I'm sorry, no, you just simply add it back over itself. All right, next. Pros, it works well in slower machines. The disadvantage is it fails with complex material. You're not going to be able to use as well with polyphonic material because uh, you, this in, invariably going to be misestimations of the period of your signal. Next, frame-based time shifting. Next, okay, this is how it works. Let's say you have your original signal. You take different different frames, as indicated here. <clears throat> You can, let's say you want to make it longer, you spread them apart, and then again you add them all together. And so you're able to take this, this example here, you're able to slow it down without changing the pitch. It's independent. Next one. 
All right, so far everything that we've done, we've done in the time domain. But you see, there's also quite a no surprise that a lot of your uh, pitch shifting or time shifting is going to be done in the frequency domain. This is again where there's a lot of different different approaches. The phase vocoder. Next. Essentially, what you do is you take your signal, you perform a Fourier transform on it. Then, you, when you do that, you've got all these little blocks. You take these blocks and you do whatever you want to. Usually, you're just simply resampling them. And then you perform an inverse, uh, an inverse transform, an inverse Fourier transform. And that's basically it. Next one. Okay. Did we skip one? Yes, here we can go back. But yeah. All right. Did I not discuss the advantages and disadvantages? Next one. No, no, go, go back. All right. Okay. But so we'll stop here. Now, what this does is this tends to produce a lot of artifacts and complex material. Other than that, it works fine. Next one. Yeah, I'm just recently redoing it. Okay, next one. Okay, now the advantages it can be done in real time on modern computers. It works well on some types of material. The disadvantage of this approach is that it does not handle transients very well. That means if you try and do sitar or tell us something like that, it tends to smear the attacks. You know, if you look at at tell or sitar, it'll look like that, where you have a very strong transient at the tops, and then it decays. Well, these transients tend to smear, and it becomes thin work very well. That's, I think that's all that I talked about. But that's pretty much all I want to talk about at this point. Now, anything over the last couple of days, do we have any questions over anything? Any, any questions at all? Then okay, yes. Okay. Delays, when we're talking about, you going back to the earlier the time, uh, go ahead, then. So, yeah, this, this area right here, uh, everything delayed, everything shifts. You see, first of all, this is all the time domain. Everything's time domain for all these delays. All we're doing here is, in software, the only thing that we're doing is you've got one subroutine, which is going and is writing to a buffer. And in a short amount of time, you have another subroutine, which is reading from the buffer. You're basically offsetting your memory locations, and by the extent of your memory, uh, I mean the offset, coupled with your sampling, that gives you the amount of delay you want. It's very cheap, not in not computationally intensive at all. Very easy to do. That's why you really don't have any limits to the number of delay lines you, you can deal with if you're doing everything in software. The only, a lot of these uh, a lot of these old architectures were really developed at times when you were dealing with hardware delay lines, which were at a premium. They were not very good, they were very expensive. You know, if you had one or two, that was really all you could do. Another thing I should mention about any of these things, <coughs> these are just a starting point, they're not the end of it. You can also mix in with just all kinds of, of filtration, so, so that the harmonic uh, content can be dipped, can be changed, so you have EQs in there. You can also, in the process, you can insert some granular base pitch shifting. You can do all kinds of fancy stuff. If you look at the number of, 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 of reverbs out there as software plugins or standalone units, then a number of options is mind boggling. This is the place where you begin. This is not the place where you're going. Good question. Anyone else have any other questions? Yes? Um, you mentioned about how uh, the technique. Uh, does it work for sitar, but works for the data? I'm sorry, what? The vocoder you mentioned. The vocoder, phase vocoder, yes. Yeah, they don't work well on sitar, uh, but they work well on. Monster, you've always things like yeah. that. The reason being 
is when you look at uh, when you look at real world signals. If you look at real world signals, if we look at it in the time domain, as a, as a general rule with computers, as much as you can do in time domain as possible, you want to do. The reason being is it's computationally not very demanding. The moment you have to start to work in the frequency domain, that means you've got to do your Fourier transforms. Then you're doing what you're going to do, and then you have to do your Fourier transforms out. That takes a lot of computational effort. But anyhow, getting back, if you look a typical, let's say, sitar or tabla or something like that, the signal will tend to look like that. At the moment where you strike the drum or strike the sitar, you get a strong transient. Now, these transients tend to smear and become indistinct with a voice vocoder, which is why that the moment you start to manipulate the pitch or time or anything like that with the phase vocoder, then that's the problem here. Any, these transients don't handle very well. Does that answer your question? Whose question? Yeah. Your, yeah. your question, yes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, if, if there are no other questions, I would like to thank you all for allowing me to come here today. Thank you very much. Good luck.